Fox Sports North. This is the first place Score North Twin Show. Let me see if I can get this right because I'm I'm not normally the one that says this. Rami says this. Okay. It is the first place Score North Twin Show, live from Bomba Soda, land of ten thousand rakes, where, where the, the magic, magic number, number is what 55? 50, 50, is it fifty five? <laughs> I think you got that right. Or is it lower than fifty five? By the way, okay. Derek Falvey joins us here uh, from the Score North Studios via the phone line. Did you know? And this is going to be a little bit depressing, but did you know that yesterday was the first day when you take away the head-to-head matchup against the Indians where you played them and took two of three? That you guys won and they lost on the same day since June 29th? Yeah, it's, it's something I, I, I definitely heard. Uh, I, saw, I saw the note about that. I mean, the reality is they've played really good baseball. They're a good team. And, you know, they've gotten a chance to take advantage of some of their schedule. And I think that recently – uh, we've certainly played some tough teams, so I think it's it's going to be tough. You know, you're playing 162 games, and it's against a really good team. Uh, I, I fully expect it'll be a fun rest of the summer. By the way, that that was really the only question we had. We just want you to listen to our trade deadline takes for 10 minutes and take notes. Is that okay? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Done deal. Sounds great. That's easy to make. <laughs> so, can you tell us what you know, and tell us what uh, what attracted you guys to Sergio Romo, who has you know, he's in his mid thirties now, but he, he was at one point, one of the premier late inning, big game relievers in all the baseball. What do you see in this uh, later stage, Sergio Romo? Well, I think there's a part of it. That's just that right there. I mean, he's got a ton of experience toward the back end of games, pitching in, in world series games and in, in meaningful spots. And I think that uh, there's no substitute for that. You only have one way of learning how to do that. And that's experience. And I think that he brings that to our to our club certainly, but what I don't want to get lost in that is this guy's a really good pitcher. You know, he's found a way to continue to evolve with his stuff. He's never been a hard thrower, even during those best years that you just referenced. And so he still isn't now and, and that's not part of his game. But what he can do is he knows how to use his slider about as well as anybody. He's still incredibly tough on right handed hitters. So we see him as somebody who can help us toward the back end of games, maybe balance out uh, some of the guys that we have that have been pitching really well against lefties, whether it's Taylor Rogers or Ryan Harper or others. So just a good fit to our bullpen. Derek, uh, we talk about the trust tree on this show, the re- the reliever trust tree and who Rocco goes to in key moments, whether it's, you know, high leverage, late in games, close game, whatever it is. Um, do you see, even in this late stage, Sergio Romo fitting into that late inning group? I mean, we've seen the season, Taylor Rogers, Tyler Duffy, Ryan Harper, I'd kind of throw Sergio Romo just looking at the numbers. He's sort of in that mix for me. Do you expect to see him there the next two months? I do. I do. I really do. And, and for a couple of reasons. One, no one in the Twins organization knows Romo uh, better than Rocco does. You know, he had him last year as part of the Tampa Bay Rays staff. Uh, he knows the person. He knows what he does at the beginning or back end of games. Uh, he was the first opener that was used. So yeah. he's willing to take the ball at any point. Uh, he just wants the ball in a big spot. And I think that Rocco is going to find a way to give it to him. I, I fully expect that he'll be one of the options there toward the back end of the game. Because like you said, guys like Taylor Rogers and Ryan Harper have had great years for us. Romo adds a different dimension to that. Who's a, a guy who's exceptionally tough on right-handers and someone who, if you take out early April, when you know, relievers can go up or down since then, he's really been among the better guys uh, that were available this deadline in our minds. Derek Falvey with us here. It's Phil Mackey, Derek Wetmore, Manny Hill uh, on the other side of the glass. The Score North Twin Show, five days a week if you are just finding it near this trade deadline. Five days a week at noon every single day and podcastable anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. Spotify, Apple, and the Score North mobile app, which is uh, free to download. So can you just like give us – I think people are really interested in how this works this time of year. And – I mean, how many plates are you spinning? How many conversations do you have going at any? Can you give any sort of glimpse into what this type of a week is like for a team that sits 20 plus games over 500 and is looking to improve its roster? Yeah, I, I think it's it's probably the same, you know, whether you're 20 under or 20 over in terms of the volume. I, I think that uh, the calls that are happening between clubs are are significant. You know, we're benefit. We benefit now from text messages and some of the other mediums that we can get messages across quickly. But uh, the reality is, you know, typically, Thad and I spend time. We split up some teams, call some different clubs, and try and gain uh, just some insight into what teams are looking to do. And I think when you're in a position we're in, 
You certainly know which teams you think are maybe more inclined to move players off their major league roster, so you're checking in more intently with those clubs. But that doesn't mean you, you leave out conversations with teams that maybe are in it. You know, you never know if there's different uh, matches that might that might work at the major league level. So you know, we stay in touch, stay in contact. I think we all know that these things tend to come down to the last 48 to 72 hours. And uh, despite, I think, all of the noise before that, the reality is most deals get done in these last 72 hours. So we'll be we'll be working pretty steadily between now and uh, the deadline. Are there teams that still don't know if they're buying or selling here a couple days before? I think that's fair to say. You know, there's an, it, because of the advent of the second wild card and, and the reality that there are a number of teams, particularly over the National League, when you look at it, there's a lot of teams that are at least close to within shouting distance of that second wild card. And those teams have to make a difficult call, certainly, as to where – where they are with competitive position. And I, I think just based on conversations I've had with clubs, uh, they may have a decent sense of where they're headed, but you know, anything can change over a really short period of time. We've seen it with a few different teams already. So uh, it, it that'll play a role, certainly. I think the fact that there won't be movement after July 31st in August will play some role in this too. So I, I would anticipate a flurry of activity maybe in the last 24 hours of the deadline. Derek, I don't know if you guys love it or hate it or maybe somewhere in between, but we have a lot of fun with the rumor mill and how much just, I'll say stuff because we're on the radio here, how much stuff flies against the wall uh, at this time of the year and maybe the weeks. Ca- categorize it, it correctly. Yeah. It's reckless speculation. It's, it's reckless speculation is what it is. That's fair to say. I'm curious to know, though, because I think um, on this show anyways, Derek, we're fans of the Sergio Romo move, kind of like the creativity involved there getting more pieces back to for Luis Luis Diaz. Um, Do you view this as your move or do you anticipate that the twins might make more trades before the deadline on Wednesday? Well, I think it's, it's, it's always hard to say until you get to the finish line, whether or not you're within striking distance. I I really felt that way over my career. There's a lot of potential conversations happening, a lot of ideas going back and forth. Typically, you don't get toward the end of that until you get closer. So we were glad that we could get Sergio. We were, I think, one of the first trades, really, of the group. I know Jake Diekman went the other day as well. But of the reliever group that had been out there, you know, there, haven't been, there hasn't been that much movement. I think that we'll continue to stay engaged. I can't necessarily handicap how, how likely, but I, I would say we'll stay engaged through the finish. And in terms of what you asked about the rumor mill, I think the reality is uh, – uh, there's a lot of things that go out there, and uh, I would say maybe half of them are, have some substance <laughs> to them. Uh, so that's just reality. But at the same time, you always want to remember that they are, you know, there are human beings and, and sometimes yes. young kids involved in your system. And you always want to make sure that you keep those kids aware. And, and our managers do a really nice job in the minor leagues of talking with those guys and saying, hey, your name may be out there. That's just part of this business. It's something for a young player to learn. So it's always always something we pay attention to even beyond what's happening at the major league level yeah no doubt quick one for you Derek before we let you go uh off day for the twins do you get to sleep in your own bed or are you guys all camped out at one twins way this week yeah I think I'll get to my home my bed at some point tonight I'm sure uh it have uh over the last couple of nights but uh I we'll we'll, we'll hole up in the office uh you won't see us outside much for lunch you know, we'll order <laughs> in and make sure that we don't we don't miss anything while we're here nice. right up until the deadline, but it, uh, it'll be a fun few days, I'm sure. Okay, well, one more we lied, just because I, I, I know you can't be super specific in answering this, but I feel like the the conundrum you guys have, or opportunity, challenge, conundrum, whatever word you want to use, is you guys have stumbled into the greatest power-hitting offense statistically in baseball history, and there's got to be at least some feeling of obligation to put some extra poker chips on this table because you have a chance to maybe win the world series. What are those discussions like internally as you try to figure out how willing are you to take chips off of future tables to put them on this table? Do you think this team can win the world series? I guess is my question. Well, I th- you're, it's always that balance to answer your question about the, about how much goes into this team and future teams. We always want to keep ourselves uh, with an eye toward both the future and the present. That's true. Every season will go through, but at the same time, we reflect on where we are as a team and, and what this group has accomplished to date. Now, I will say the group that has accomplished what they've done so far, uh, that's the group that's downstairs. And anytime you're making an addition, you are making a subtraction, and, and that makes it more challenging. And I think that 
anytime you look at a, a group that we have right now, position player wise, has really done a nice job. Pitching, I think, has really stepped up on, in aggregate. You know, if you look at most of our our young guys coming up and the way our starters have performed for the year, so I think there's certainly there will always be opportunity to improve. But I also want to reflect on what the guys have done in that clubhouse. Uh, I think adding Romo was a a great stabilizer and a unique weapon that we can use out in the bullpen toward the back end of games. I'm hopeful there'll be other opportunities going forward to add this team, but we're going to compete uh, all the way through. And I, I have, I have a lot of confidence in the way this team's going to battle uh, hopefully right in and through the playoffs. That is chief baseball officer with the Minnesota twins, Derek Falvey. Uh, we speak on behalf of a lot of fans. This is an exciting time and an exciting week. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing what happens in the next 48 to 72 hours. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Have a great day. Thanks, Derek. Derek Falvey. Well, that is going to be a fascinating uh, sprint to the finish here because I loved your question, Phil, on how many many lines do you have in the water? Like, have you ever gone fishing on one of those boats that you're kind of just trolling around the lake and you've got maybe like three, four lines out? Constantly getting crossed and like unless you're really skillful at it, it's, it's a challenging thing to pull off well. And the twins are doing that with like 75 lines, I'm sure. I, he, he didn't put a number on it, but I'm going to throw it out there. Constant conversations yeah. with multiple teams on multiple different fronts. This will be a, a super fun sprint to the I finish. think oh, – wait a second. Hold on. See, Judd just retweeted some Bob Nightingale. Let's yeah, see a little breaking news. I thought news. this was twins. Uh, nope, it's not. Never mind. I thought it was – You've got your radar I up. I got to say, like Phil's kind of always on alert for this. Yeah. No, you should see. I have I – have, for the people watching right now on the stream, I literally have like – sections of my tweet deck for twins news major league baseball i've got like the the mount rushmore of baseball reporters all pouring into (laughs) one feed so if if ken rosenthal stays up late and has indigestion like i see it on my feed that was me with nba free agency (laughs) right that that day me and danny did that show i just had a tweet deck open of johnny k Shams, Woj, just everybody <laughs> injected, you could think of yes, was just yes, injected yes. into my veins. Man. Phil's walking around on pins and needles, like, hold on, a retweet. Oh, wait, it's just a regular. Oh, it's just a but news. Okay. Can I ask you guys this too? And I, and this is fun because we do this on Mackie and Jeb with Rami, and you guys are doing this, and I'm and I've been on the Scorner Twin Show a handful of times. But I, if 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 the twins are wondering, all right, how careful should we be? about taking some of these chips off of the 2022 table, 2021 table, they're trying to be the responsible adult, which is, hey, we got to look out. It's not just a win now, satisfy now thing here. You this can't is, just party all night. You got homework to do in the morning. You've got a future of of plenty of seasons in which you could be competitive. And they're trying to balance that with, yeah, but this team is on pace to shatter the Major League Baseball home run record and you should get it some pitching help. Again, yesterday, for like the 15th time, they hit four home runs in the game. This train isn't slowing right. down. Right? Offensively, yeah. this God. train isn't slowing down. I know there's homework in the morning, but this party's super yeah. fun. I just want to tell them, and, I, and Derek, if you're still listening, fans will be okay if you take a shot this year and it doesn't work out. I don't think they're going to say, well, pfft. what do you do? Look, look at now, now Kirilov's gone. I think people would say, you know what? They took their shot. People praise the Vikings for taking their shot, even though the economics of those sports are entirely different. I think I think you can gain a lot of trust back with the Twins fan base, and, and they've gained a lot back already. Just look at the attendance for the season. Yeah. If you take a shot, the organization hasn't taken a shot with if Terry Ryan, Bill Smith, some of those seasons they weren't in a position to take a shot, whether it was because they were at the Metrodome and they just didn't have the same type of payroll um, compared to target field teams but don't be afraid to take a shot people will people will applaud you for taking a shot i fair play i i look at too with like look at what they've gotten out of nelson cruz i mean when they signed nelson cruz did any of us i mean we we figured okay yeah nice signing he's hit a lot of home runs he's a good professional hitter maybe mentor miguel sano a little bit but could you have imagined him having this type of season at 39 years old when they signed incredible He's, yeah, he's been amazing. He's given you more than Jim Tomey gave you when he was 39 yeah. years old. And Jim and Tomey was awesome here. That in was a celebration. Yeah. And I mean, a guy like that who's been in World Series before, it's like this guy's given you so much more than you could have even imagined. It's like, let's go for a push, even, you know, if anything, for this guy to give him a shot at winning a ring, you know? Well, that the, the Nelson Cruz factor is to go back to caller Dan in St. Paul's point from I don't know, 15, 20 minutes ago. 
And he said, I just feel like the Twins might still be a year or two away when you size them up against the Yankees and the Astros. And, okay, well, let's go a year or two down the road. Nelson Cruz is going to be 40. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you're not, or not on the team or not as effective or any combination of those things. You know, some of these guys like CJ Crone might not be on the team and he's been hurt the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. but you're not guaranteed to capture this type of magic in a lineup again in 2021 or 22 when you're hoping that Alex Kirloff can be part of it, hoping that Royce Lewis can be part of it. I think you have to come to terms with if you're going to make a big splashy move or you're thinking about pulling a Noah Syndergaard trigger, are you okay with watching one of your top prospects be amazing for another franchise for 10 years, which is what the Cubs are doing right now, looking around the league, even if they don't win the World Series? Because when the Cubs traded for all this Chapman, there were no guarantees, and they almost lost in Game 7 of the World Series. Yes, they did. And you just have to be at peace with rolling the dice if that's the decision you make, even if you don't win the World Series in the end. It's the thing I get the pushback on maybe the most, but it's the stance I'm going to – this is the – Phil, you like to use the phrase, the hill I'm going to die on. I am defending this hill, and you can't get me off of it. You're going to have to take me out of it feet first. It is that these guys – I'm talking specifically about Derek Falvey, Thad Levine, you know, Daniel Adler, Jeremy Zoll, on and on down the list of crew that Falvey has assembled since he took over in Minnesota have earned the trust of, of you, of me, of Manny, of Rami, all the way from Milwaukee, and of Twins fans. Clearly, they're showing that trust and showing up to the park a lot, talking about the Twins on Twitter, watching their games, complaining when their games get taken off of certain broadcast providers. Like, the support is there, but my point here is that they have done so well to take this team from where they were when Falvey took over to get them into a spot to not only win the American League Central, but be a legitimate World Series contender. Maybe a piece or two away, but a World Series contender, no less, that I think that they've earned the benefit of the doubt to say, yeah, yeah I think that they're going to have a good week. They might add another piece or two, and then it's a team that's ready to buckle up and go for a World Series. But you also think you're sort of at this organizational – philosophical crossroads here what's that where if you don't if you're not trading and i'm not advocating that they should absolutely trade royce lewis or alex kirloff i think if you can if you can upgrade a couple more times and hang on to those guys that's clearly the best of both worlds that's right where you, i'm going that's my path yeah, right now. that would be the best path and uh the fact that you could have had you could have had marcus stroman for less than alex kirloff or royce lewis and here we are that's an interesting one but I think if you're not willing to trade Royce Lewis or Alex Kirloff this year with this offense and and this type of stronghold on at least playing October baseball, is there ever going to be a scenario in the next 10 years in which you would trade prospects? I mean, you're basically the, the, the philosophical crossroad is would you trade one of those prospects in a win now move? And this is the perfect scenario to pull the trigger if you're ever going to pull the trigger on trading one of those guys. Yeah, it depends on your evaluation of those guys. Like, I'll tr I'll absolutely trade prospects. I'll trade prospects three through ten if you want me to, but I'm not trading those two guys. The way that I look at this, Phil, is you could rewind this three years ago, and we would have been having the same conversation about Max Kepler. Would have been saying, "All right, listen, I know the kid's well regarded, and he's going to be one of the best German-born players of all time." Like. That's great, but we have a chance to win. Not apples to apples. I get it, because 2015 was sort of more of a pop year. I think we all kind of knew that at the time. But this is the exact same conversation we would have had then, and 95% of people would have been fine to sell Max Kepler down the road. And that's cool. I got no problem with that. I'm not a prospect hoarder. Yeah. But if you don't have Max Kepler on the 2019 Twins, where are they now?